Thank you for watching the next show and welcome to Hamburg, David. Great to have you. Thanks for having me and hi everyone out there. Great to see you again. We're looking forward to welcoming fantastic speakers on season four and today we will welcome Christopher Minns. Yes, that's right. I'm so excited about this week's guest. Our guest this week is Christopher Minns. He's a technology columnist on the Wall Street Journal and he's here to talk to us about global supply chains, how they evolved, how they're set to evolve in future and how that will influence the systems that govern all our lives and shape our businesses. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, many systems have been shaken in the past two years and we will be talking about that uh, during the next conference where our theme will be Hug the System this year. And I'm looking forward to hear your thought on systems because you want to share one today, don't yes, you? Yes, indeed. I've got lots of thoughts to share about systems and how we can hug them. Some of them at the next conference, but I have a thought this week that I'd love to share with you and with all of you out there. Would be great to welcome you in Hamburg and hug you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a thought about Web3 and systems of power. So I've been thinking a lot and speaking a lot recently about one of the biggest technology trends reshaping our shared future, and that is Web3. What do we mean by this idea, by this word we've heard so much about Web3? Well, it's about a new kind of internet built on blockchains, decentralized ledgers, essentially shared databases that allow people to transact with one another and collaborate with one another without a trusted middleman or without a leader and some people believe that this technology can fundamentally reshape the world around us, can reshape the systems that govern our lives in the 21st century. What, for example, about decentralized finance? A new global financial system, a new economic system built not on traditional money, fiat currency issued by central governments, but on a new kind of money, internet money, crypto money, issued and controlled by the people. What about decentralized business? You see people coming together now in organizations called DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, organizations run on blockchain. So there's a startup in the US right now that I love called Fry's DAO. Thousands of people coming together on a blockchain and what they're doing is they're pooling their funds and they're using that money to go out and buy underperforming fast food franchises and they believe that they can run these businesses better than traditional startups, traditional businesses with one leader and a small executive board. What about decentralized social media? We know on our version of the internet, the current version of the internet, the social media platforms have amassed vast power. They suck up all the attention, their algorithms decide what we get to see, they've sucked up all the advertising revenue or certainly lots of it. What if we built decentralized equivalents of Facebook, of Twitter, of Instagram? So platforms truly built and controlled and governed by the users. These are the thoughts about the ways Web3 can reshape the world around us in the 21st century. But there is an emerging problem with all this. What if we don't, with Web3, achieve true decentralization, true people power? What if instead we just get new centers of power and new elites? So look, for example, at the massive NFT trading platform OpenSea, it is sucking up a lot of the trading volume when it comes to NFTs. It's becoming a kind of Facebook, if you like, of NFT trading. Is that what we wanted for Web3, another massive centralized platform? Look at the way Elon Musk can move the price of a cryptocurrency like Dogecoin with just a single tweet or an appearance on Saturday Night Live. So you have a very powerful person, the world's richest person, changing the price radically of a crypto token through his behavior. Does that really feel like true decentralization? So these are the issues we face right now with Web3 and decentralization. And look, the truth is that most of the people participating in Web3 are already quite powerful and quite affluent. One of the most famous DAOs out there right now is a DAO called Flamingo DAO. It's all about art investment. 
it cost $25,000 to buy into Flamingo Dow back in 2020 when it started. Its portfolio of art is now worth $1 billion and it costs $7 million to buy into the Dow. So the danger we face with Web3 is that we don't get true decentralization. We get instead new centers of power and a new economic elite. And really this reminds me in the end of the story of the internet and the early days of the internet. Way back in the early 90s, the early pioneers of the web dreamed of this new space, cyberspace, that would be radically democratic, that would be free of influence from traditional centers of power, that would empower millions or billions of ordinary people all around the world. And look, it has done that in some ways, but we all know the internet didn't turn out quite as those early web pioneers imagined it. The dream was not completely fulfilled and the dangers we face with Web3 are the same. So really what I'm saying with this thought is that we need to learn that lesson. We need to take the lessons we should have learned from the early days of the internet and the ways in which that dream were not fulfilled and apply them to Web3 so that we can embrace true decentralization and true people power. I am super excited to welcome this week's guest to the next show. Christopher Mims is a technology reporter for the Wall Street Journal where he writes the weekly keywords column. Before that, he was lead technology reporter for the business publication Quartz. And in his latest book, Arriving Today, he talks about global supply chains, how they're evolving, their history and their future. And that's what we're here to talk to him about today, these hidden systems that shape so much of the world around us. I am super excited to dive into this conversation. Christopher, welcome to The Next Show. How are you? Yeah, thanks for having me. I am doing fantastic and uh, I'm glad we could connect in this way, even though I can't be in Hamburg today. Yeah, we'd love to have you in Hamburg one time soon, but for now, this is absolutely perfect. Thank you so much for being with us. Like I say, I'm so excited to dive into this conversation. There's so much I want to ask you about supply chains. We here at Next are obsessed with systems and systems thinking and how systems shape the world around us. Supply chains are clearly a hugely complex system, so we're fascinated to hear what you have to say. I would love to, I mean, there's a million places we could start, but I'd love to start just with the backstory of the book. I mean, you started writing the book Arriving Today, uh, before the pandemic, what drew you into this story? What drew you towards supply chains as a subject? Strangely enough, it was robots. I was actually uh, in, a, in a suburb not far from your hometown in London, and I was in a, a robotic warehouse run by a company uh, called Ocado. And, uh, you know, they do fast grocery delivery. And I was very impressed that inside their warehouse, there was one human being and dozens of robots that were doing all of the retrieval of groceries. And it was, even out of factories I've been inside, it was the most automated facility I'd ever been in. And I really felt like I had stepped into the matrix. And I said, this feels like the intersection of AI, robotics, you know, the internet, the cloud, instant delivery, uh, convenience, you know, late capitalism. And I just thought, I have to write about this. So. As I investigated it more and more, I just realized, well, this is one part of the larger global supply chain, which is changing in ways that I think are really unexpected and underappreciated and very technology driven, but also very human because, you know, supply chain remains an incredibly labor intensive industry, but also a technology and robotics intensive industry. So in few other places in human endeavor, do we have this just complete marriage of human and machine and 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 really like a dialogue between the two where the way that one changes changes the other one and then ultimately of course this is what we all depend on to get all of the goods that we uh you know need or think we need or want every day right yeah i mean i find that story about the robots in the in the the factory completely fascinating it just strikes me you know, I mean, I talk a lot about consumer trends and we think a lot about changing consumer behavior on the next show.
but there's this whole world of hidden innovation behind the end consumer experience or the end customer experience, right? I mean, people think a lot about Amazon and maybe the, the kind of last mile, you know, what they do to get it to your door. But there's a whole world of hidden innovation behind that, right, that Amazon are pulling off or have pulled off across the last decade to make what they do possible. Yeah, it's really tremendous. And it's not just Amazon. It's a ton of companies that I think most people just don't even know the names of. You know, like ask the average person, you know, name the three largest uh, shipping carriers in the world. And like, you know, maybe they've seen Maersk somewhere, um, you know, but the innovation that's happening there in ships and imports is no less important. That's what Amazon depends on to get those goods across oceans to us, whether we're, you know, in Africa or Europe or Asia or the Americas or anywhere. Um, and, and the same is true also for things that seem really mundane and like they're really mature technologies like trucking, like trucking is this unbelievably technologically intensive industry in a way that most people just don't realize and is only becoming, you know, more so, uh, with the possibility of the debut of, you know, self-driving trucks for some routes. Right. And I'm really excited to talk about some of this coming innovation in the future of supply chains before we get there. Let's dive into the pandemic because you're, you're, I mean, talk me through that experience for a start. You know, you're writing this book about global supply chains and suddenly this, uh, you know, tectonic, historic, disruptive event happens that has huge implications for supply chains. I mean, talk to me about how that felt as a writer, like how it disrupted your, your process and your telling of the story. And then let's talk about what the pandemic did to global supply chains and some of the lessons that we should draw out of that. But first of all, just how did it feel when this massive news story interrupted the story you were trying to tell? Yeah, it was stunning because I was absolutely just at the midpoint of researching the book. I was standing on the dock in Vietnam at the beginning of the journey of this object that I was going to trace the path of around the world. You know, and I got a text uh, about like, hey, have you heard about what's going on in China? Like, is this affecting you? Because, you know, here you are in Southeast Asia. And I was like, I don't know what pandemic. What are you talking about? Lockdown? I had no idea. Um, but it added a great deal of urgency to writing and reporting the book because the the containers that I was watching get loaded on that ship that day, that day, that skyscraper sized ship were the containers of material, including things like, um, you know, PPE uh, and, and other goods that were going to be needed for the medical response in the States uh, that were about to be, you know, panic bought uh, by the time, you know, a month later when I was back in the States. So it, it, it really uh, just kind of blew up the whole story in, in, in a way that was good for me as a reporter, because subsequently, you know, I was in facilities that were handling, you know, the middle and the last mile of delivery in the supply chain, you know, and I was wearing a mask, everyone else was wearing a mask. And they were describing to me, this is what it's like, this is our new reality, like we are dealing, we're operating at maximum capacity. And this is what that looks like, and how it has felt. And, um, you know, so I, I it, it was a little bit like just stepping into like a conflict zone or something, uh, you know, not really comparable, but just in the sense of everyone having that sense of urgency in what is otherwise, you know, can feel like a kind of a sleepy enterprise, even though it's important, which is just delivering things to you. Right. And I mean, you're writing this book that was always going to be absolutely fascinating, but is suddenly urgent in this whole new way, um, which is always a thrill for a journalist. I think it's never a bad thing, certainly. This is a huge question and we can only scratch the surface. You know, I mean, people who want to dive deeper into it should read the book for sure. What did the pandemic do to supply chains? I mean, you talk about this amazing moment where it all kind of came crashing down on your head when you're standing there in Vietnam. What did you see unfold next? You know, I mean, we, we saw it feels to me looking from the outside pretty clearly, you know, we saw some pretty extreme fragility and the fragility of supply chains was exposed in new ways. Yeah, there were a lot of different uh, ways that the supply chain was either stretched beyond its capacity or just broke down. I mean, the way in which it was stretched beyond its capacity is that supply chains, they cannot flex 
quickly. You cannot suddenly add, you know, dozens more container ships, each of which can hold up to 10,000 40-foot shipping containers. You know, you cannot suddenly double port capacity. I mean, that takes, you know, $10 billion in 20 years. So when people kind of went on a buying spree about two months into the pandemic in the U.S. and elsewhere, um, you know, supply chains were, were stretched beyond their limit and there were tons of things that people just couldn't get. And then there were also just tons of challenges at, you know, kind of the wellspring of our global goods, these sort of idiosyncratic problems where, you know, for a while, every, you know, people here in the U.S. especially remember not being able to get toilet paper or not being able to get, you know, a laptop so their kid could study from home. Um, you know, and even well into the pandemic, years into the pandemic, you know, not being able to get lumber for new housing construction or now microchips, which has shut down automotive production all around the world over and over and over again. And each one of those illustrated, you know, a particular vulnerability in a particular supply chain, but also was a product of these shared vulnerabilities, like not enough capacity at ports or ports being shut down because of COVID or sailors being trapped on ships for months beyond the end of their contracts because they could not get off and, and be rotated out as they're supposed to be, you know, at the end of their contracts, which usually never last more than six to nine months. Yeah, toilet paper was a huge one as well in the UK. We had we had some really fun uh, toilet paper shortages, the empty shelves, the pictures of the, the, the totally empty shelves were all over the place. I mean, it's particularly acute, isn't it, for food? Because that, you know, is such a time-driven supply chain because food goes off, right? I mean, you're, you know, you're charting the, the progress across the globe of this piece of technology, a USB charger, which is absolutely fascinating. Food, though, is a particularly acute challenge. Am I right? Yeah, food, especially now, is a particularly acute challenge for a number of reasons because of, you know, drought and climate change. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think that you really saw that um, acutely in places where food is imported, like the UK, you know. Um, uh, you know, in Asia, there were, have been huge problems getting enough soybeans into the country because of shipping container shortages. So that was an unexpected product of these supply chain snafus. Not enough shipping containers. Uh, you know, suddenly China's missing out on a third of its soybean imports. You know, these are things that we don't think about when the supply chains are operating smoothly. But as soon as they start to get, you know, tangled up or there's a blockage, um, you know, it can start to feel like an existential threat, especially when it's about things like food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And these crazy stories, I mean, part of what I found so fascinating about the book, these crazy stories you hear about foods in particular, it feels to me, going on these insane journeys across the globe before they reach, you know, the end customer, before they reach your plate, um, which I've always questioned, like, can that really be true that the, you know, the apple I'm eating was like, you know, washed in Vietnam and then packaged in, you know, Germany and then sent to me to the UK. It turns out those stories are true, right? I mean, you tell this amazing story in the book about cod, I think it is, I remember. Yeah, there's a classic uh, story about cod because, you know, cod is still caught in the North Atlantic off the coast of Scotland. Um, and then, you know, a, a large proportion of that cod is flash frozen, uh, shipped to China or Southeast Asia where it is filleted and then shipped back to Scotland in order to be turned into fish and chips, because it is cheaper to ship it all that distance on a ship on the ocean than it is to, you know, find the labor domestically or, or, or closer to Scotland in order to prepare that fish. Right. And I mean, that obviously leads everyone to ask massive questions about how sustainable in every sense of the word, I mean, how sane that is and whether it can continue. So I want to turn this conversation to the future and take a look at what's coming next. You know, the technologies that are about to, that are currently and about to reshape global supply chains and the way all this is going to look in future because it feels like there's still huge unanswered questions and, you know, stories like that raise huge unanswered questions about what is coming next and what should come next. So let's start here with, I mean, you touched on one. Let's start here with the technologies that are reshaping supply chains now. Driverless trucks feels one of the big ones to me. Uh, what are some of the others? Driverless trucks are definitely one of the biggest. Um, 
I think also uh, new business models. I mean, I always think of uh, sometimes new business models and, and cultural change can be a form of technology, you know, the same way that, you know, writing was both a, a new culture and a new technology. Um, you know, what Amazon figured out about, you know, here's how we combine, you know, AI and a certain amount of robotics to get you, you know, 15 million different items tomorrow if you want them. You know, that is both a, a, a business model and a technological innovation. So those are huge as well. I mean, you're seeing it uh, with the rise of so-called instant needs startups, you know, there these are all over the world. You know, there's some that have come out of Turkey, Russia. There's a big one in the U.S. called GoPuff, and they're really mastering the next evolution of that, which is, you know, I don't want my goods in two days or one day. I want them in 30 minutes, and here's how we're going to do that economically. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes it's just the smart application of existing information technology to precisely the right business model and, you know, figuring out where to put those local warehouses to make that work. I mean, I also like to write about things like drone delivery. Um, but honestly, when I talk to those companies, they're like, well, drone delivery is going to work in some places, you know, I mean, Google's making it work in Australia. Uh, it's starting to work in some suburban areas in the US. They're testing it in Japan. Um, they're testing it in Israel, but that's going to have limited application for a while. I mean, there's also autonomous vehicles that are purpose built for delivery. Uh, you know, they don't, you don't have to have an autonomous vehicle that weighs 3000 pounds delivering a, uh, you know, a five pound takeout meal. You can do it with a, a small six wheeled robot or a medium sized four wheeled robot. So there's really this Cambrian explosion of different ways to try and automate those parts of the delivery process that are coming. But again, a lot of the innovation is hidden, you know, a lot of it can be um, more automation in small uh, so-called micro fulfillment centers, which are small warehouses where goods are shipped, you know, locally. So you can get them in 30 minutes. Um, and then obviously there's all the robots that Amazon employs and continues to roll out. And they are absolutely essential to its scale. I mean, that's the reason that, you know, um, Jeff Bezos is sometimes the richest person in the world and that Amazon is the second largest employer in the U.S. after Walmart, and frankly, give them two to five years, I think they'll be the largest employer in the United States and one of the largest employers in the world. Yeah, this new wave of inno innovation, like gorillas, you know, these startups that are literally doing groceries to your door in 10, 15 minutes, I have to admit that's taken me by surprise, given the conversation we've had across the last decade about, you know, um, the tyranny of convenience and the gig economy and some of the difficulties with that and Amazon. I didn't expect this whole new wave of innovation just based on going even faster, even more ultra convenient. Do you think that's the direction we should be heading in? Is that a sustainable direction? I mean, this gets philosophical, I know, pretty quickly. But what do you make of all that? Because, yeah, it just took me by surprise. That's a great question. I think that when you take a step back, you can make a very good case that um, modern technology has been, you know, in the words of, of, of one uh, clinical psychologist whose work I admire, who wrote a book that everyone should read. It's called Dopamine Nation. Modern technology has been drugified. So, you know, when Tristan Harris of the Center for Humane Technology, you know, pulls out uh, a smartphone and says that social media apps on it are like having a slot machine in your pocket, and they addict us in the same way. I think that the same applies to the convenience of one-click shopping, of fast delivery. I think that these devices that we carry around with us um, are designed to tap into our, you know, very primate instinct toward, you know, instant gratification, toward convenience. And they are, you know, they're designed to keep us clicking, scrolling, desiring, shopping and you know i think in the long run it is a challenge and it's something that we are as human beings as a society just beginning to figure out how to adapt to i mean how many years did it take us to figure out what was good and bad about television you know 50 years you know the smartphone has only been ubiquitous in our pockets for just over a decade so these are very important questions because we have only just begun to figure out what are the social norms around this? What do we think should be uh, acceptable? What should we be horrified by? Right, and it's, uh, yeah, it's that difficult way that these waves of innovation 
you know, crash into one another. I mean, it's so funny you mentioned television. You know, I often think that maybe we were just about to start to get a handle on the, the impacts of television on our societies and our democracy. But then the sort of any attempt to do that coherently was just kind of swept away by this huge other wave of media and content uh, innovation driven by the internet. And now it's, just, yeah, we, we never really finished our thought about TV. For those of us old enough to remember when there was just TV, we never really finished our thought about yeah. that. So what you say about gorillas and this new wave of, yeah, like 10, 15 minute delivery, it feels to me just taps into the massive underlying question that maybe we can close on around the future of supply chains. And it's just fundamentally, you know, do you feel like we're going to go to a place driven by these technologies, you know, port automation, driverless trucks, business model innovation, where global supply chains become even faster, even more resilient, or let's say more resilient, more effective, able to, you know, deliver us what we want, when we want it, even more effectively than they do now? Or are we going to head to a place where we say, we need to, to a certain extent, wean ourselves off that, wean ourselves off our addiction, if you want to put it that way, to these global supply chains, and just make our consumption more local and less intense in some ways. Um, which way do you think it's going to go, and which way would you like to see it go? I get, you know, those are two different questions. I, I think that our consumption may be reduced. I think that is the direction that I would like it to go. I think that the reason that will happen, though, is not because people decide to do it. It will be because, in various ways, global supply chains, as they exist now, will prove to be not just environmentally, but economically unsustainable. And so I think that, you know, we underestimated our peril, the extent to which prices are rising now because of all these challenges and challenges supply chains. And as local alternatives become relatively more affordable, as it makes sense to um, bring manufacturing back to countries, you know, so-called reshoring, um, prices are going to go up. People will consume less as a result. And more of that production will be closer to where the consumption occurs. I, I think it's just simple economics will drive that. Right. So you see a future where, yeah, that, that to a certain extent is imposed on people. Because I guess, you know, the, I mean, you did mention it, but the, the huge phrase, the huge shadow hanging over so much of this, right, is climate change. I mean, we're going to find that some of these supply chains and supply chain technologies are not sustainable on a, on a planetary front. Is that fair to say? Um, yes, it's, it's always difficult to make predictions because sometimes new technologies come along that, you know, allow us to continue to expand, you know, our consumption and the length of our supply chains. But absolutely, I think that in many ways we are running up against various planetary boundaries as we have in the past, and those are going to limit our consumption. Right. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult message for business to a certain extent. You know, it's a challenging message, but maybe they have to get, they have to start planning for a world where consumption doesn't continue to grow in the way it has done, where limits impose themselves to a certain extent. Yeah, and I think it's a huge opportunity. Look, Elon Musk is the richest person on the planet, in part because he bet early on electric vehicles. Um, you know, say whatever else you want about him, like he was a visionary in that way. I think that there is tons of opportunity for other businesses to say, here's where I think this is going. We're going to be in a world where, you know, we need more clean energy. You know, we need more, you know, local manufacturing and consumption. How do I build a business today anticipating that we'll be so much further down that road 10, 20 years from now? Perfect. That is an inspiring that's an inspiring point to end on, an inspiring place to bring this conversation almost to a halt. Chris, thank you so much for joining us on The Next Show. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Anyone who's interested in what we've talked about should dive into the book Arriving Today. It's an absolutely brilliant read. Do not go away, Christopher, because before we let you go, there is one more thing we would like to do with you, for you. We are going to transport you to the planet next one. So stay right there. <laughs> Okay, Christopher, imagine this. It is the near future. 
Amid an acute crisis on planet Earth, a team of crack technologists hatches a daring plan to start a new chapter for humanity. Along with 1,000 specially selected pioneers, they are going to travel far beyond the solar system to the planet next one, and there they will start a new permanent base, a new civilization. Christopher Mims, thanks to your achievements in the fields of technology journalism, you have been selected to be among those first 1,000 pioneers. Before you board the rocket, there are five key questions you need to answer. Are you ready to answer those questions, Christopher? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, question number one. Name a luxury physical object that you would like to take with you to next one. Super high-end Bose noise-canceling headphones, so we can always listen to Earth music and also tune out each other. Great choice. You cannot go on a flight without noise-canceling headphones, so you definitely don't want to be going all the way to next one without those headphones. We don't know how long the journey will take, but I think it's, I think we're talking months here. Question number two. Name a book you think everyone should read before they start the journey. Uh... A Hundred Years of Solitude by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, because it's about the sort of unchanging nature of humans and why we should celebrate it and be wary of it. Perfect, thank you. Question number three, name an exceptional person you think should be among the first 1,000 pioneers. Uh, I would pick the current uh, world memory champion, Emma Alam because I think one of the most important uh, characteristics of humanity is our ability to tell stories, remember them, uh, pass them on. And so we're gonna need a memory champion around to help us preserve our history, no matter what happens to our physical media. Love it. And if the internet goes down, you can use that person as a kind of human Google, I'm guessing, which could prove very useful. Okay, question number four, name a law that bans something from next one forever. Uh, I would ban uh, financial speculation untethered from any actual value creation. So that would probably disappoint a lot of the NFT fans, uh, but also uh, a lot of the Wall Street financial analysts who we might not be bringing along on this trip. Yeah, love it. That's a great one. It's going to prove very controversial, like you say. I see, I see a war brewing there with the crypto bros and the, the anti-crypto people. Um, question number five, final question. Name a tradition from planet Earth that you would like to see replicated on next one. Definitely Midsummer, because it's the greatest holiday I've ever personally uh, participated in. I don't know what planet we're going to, but if you can make yourself a wreath of flowers and dance around a maypole uh, and uh, have yourself a nice Swedish sauna, what could be better? Love it, yes. And I'm sure that that can be arranged on next one. We don't know how long the year will be, but every summer you can definitely dance around a maypole. Thank you so much for those answers. Grab your noise cancelling headphones, board the rocket, but much more important, thank you so much for joining us on the next show. It's been absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thanks so much, Christopher. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being our guest today and thank you for watching. I also would like to thank our partners Accenture Song and Factor Drive for their support. If you would like to join us live, simply apply for a ticket for the next conference in September in Hamburg on our website. Hope to see you there. Bye bye. <music>